Carol Wilcox, I'm the Chief Clinical Dietitian here at Fremont. I'm Misty Crow, the Clinical Coordinator for Cardiopulmonary. So we're going to um, teach uh, our CCC Module 2 today. So uh, we really focused on the objectives. Get my papers here. So assess progress with implementation of caring behaviors. So this is what we really want to have you understand after today's training. Uh, acknowledge that patient suffering through empathetic communication and identification of spoken and unspoken needs. So making sure we're looking at body language, understanding maybe our nonverbal cues from our patients um, or even coworkers, and then personalize our key behavioral strategies to effectively integrate them into our daily routine. So objective one, uh, so this is like I said, our reflection on module one, our review. So acknowledge and make me feel welcome when I arrive. So we always wanna make our patients feel welcome. Uh, look for opportunities to reduce no noise. So we talked about not having those conversations about our weekend right outside of a patient's room, um, making sure we're not slamming cupboard doors or anything like that in the hallways. Uh, just trying to make sure that it's really quiet for our patients. Of course, we would want that at home for ourselves. Um, everyone can respond to a call late, even if you um, not necessarily can take care of the patient's needs. So any department, any employee can pop into a patient room, see why that patient has that call light on. And if it is something that you can handle, of course, help that patient. But if it is something that requires a tech or a nurse, then go ahead and get that help from that um, nurse. Um, narrate my care so I know what is happening, what I can expect, and key things that I need to know. Communication goes a long way. We learned in module one that our patients don't necessarily love when we hover over them. So anytime we can take a seat next to them on the bed, um, look at them, have direct eye contact, explain things a little bit more, it does make them feel more comfortable and more in the know. Uh, be warm and welcome, welcoming with all interactions. I am a person and you want to be part of the team. So just make sure that we're um, being kind, courteous to our patients and our coworkers at all times. So identifying situations that you may be put in. Um, are we viewing situations for the, from the patient's perspective? Uh, so non-judgment things. So a patient talking about maybe a pet at home, you know, not judging them for worrying about their pets, maybe um, their pet is their life. Maybe they don't have a lot of visitors and their dog or their cat or their bunny is someone that's really important to them. And so if a patient says, well, I'm really worried about my pet, um, who's gonna feed it? Instead of judging them and say, you know, in our head thinking, oh, well, you know, you should be more worried about your care, your blood sugars are out of control than your dog. Understand and listen to their concern and see if there's some, how you can help that patient. Um, identifying situations that can trigger anxiety for patient. This is reading nonverbal cues, reading the room. If you're talking to a patient and they look like they're shutting down, I don't know if having another 10 minute conversation with them is probably the appropriate thing that morning. Um, seeing if maybe we can move on and, and talk to them at a different time, or maybe ask a coworker to talk to them. Maybe they just didn't like your approach. Um, refraining from judgment, that's kind of what we talked about with the pet example already. Um, implementing practices to help alleviate patient anxiety. So if there's things that we can see from our patients that are causing anxiety, like uh, not talking to them, if we're constantly just you know charting on our computer and we're not necessarily making eye contact with them, listening or like half listening, that could cause them to be really anxious about not knowing what their care means, not explaining noises, if we're not explaining what the alarms are with our IV pole or things like that. Um, avoiding practices that can um, elevate patient anxiety. So if you know, notice any of those things in module one that we kind of talked about that maybe um, aren't something you do already, trying to relate to the patient. Remember the picture in module one where we had a picture of the baseball blanket, you know, asking them, hey, do you like baseball? If you see that they have a baseball blanket, is there a game I can try to help find on the TV? Just trying to relate to that patient as much as we can. Um, I can't see that far. <coughs> Finding out at least one, one non-diagnosis related thing. So we kind of talked about that with the baseball blanket. 
connecting with the patients, their non-diagnosis related facts, own experience. So remember, it's okay to throw in some of your own experiences, but don't take over that conversation. So if a patient says, oh, I'm really sad about my dog being home alone, you don't wanna necessarily say, oh yeah, well, my dog's home alone every day when I work. Like that's really not relating to them. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're empathetic and referring to the personal facts throughout their patient's stay. So if you can remember a personal fact from visit to visit, so if you only do a follow-up <clears throat> every two days, just you know, bringing up the fact that they watched that baseball game, like, oh, who won the game the other night? Um, is there any other teams that you like? Something that you can remember from time to time. I know when I go to a doctor's appointment, even though I know they put notes in their chart and they're like, hey, how's your daughter? Has she graduated already? Or I remember now she's engaged. You know, anytime something that they bring up as personal, it does make you feel good, right? Like, even though they may be making notes to themselves, they're still putting that time and effort to, to bring something up that's personal. And so that's what we wanna do with our patients as well. Um, showing care for patients and their loved ones by introducing yourselves. I think a lot of times we maybe will only talk to the family and not talk to the patient or only talk to the patient and not talk to the family. We wanna make sure that we're talking to everybody in the room. Of course, if that's appropriate, making sure that you can even ask questions in front of that family members, um, if it's okay to bring up some of those things. Um, and then just also include those in the conversations if there's any concerns that they have. You can ask those family members, like, do you wanna drink? Do you need a blanket? Is there something we can do to help your stay be more comfortable? So communication, writing. So years of formal training, 12 years. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about listening. Reading, we have formal training of six to eight years. Speaking, one to two years. And so obviously this is including what we learned in like elementary school and high school. And then listening, we have zero to a half a year of formal training. So module two is gonna be a lot about listening and how we can be better listeners for our patients. Of course, the value of listening. Um, people have a deep need for others to listen to them and understand them. And I thought this was really interesting because I think we think the person that speaks over someone or speaks a lot is controlling the conversation. Listeners actually control the conversation. And so we wanna make sure that we're listening to our patients and listening to our coworkers just so we can have a better understanding. So these were the papers that were passed out. If you want to go to your first one. Okay. So I didn't get much sleep last night. These beds are terrible. So should our response be A, your doctor can prescribe something to help with that. Or if you're a visitor, we can get you a blanket and pillow tonight. Do you think that that should be our first response? No. Hospitals aren't known for being a place where you get much sleep. You shouldn't expect to get much sleep while you're here. <laughs> I don't think I've had a full night's sleep since my daughter was born and she's six. Should that be my response to my patient? No. No. Oh no, what was keeping you up? And then last but not least, I imagine you're already pretty tired. Lack of sleep must make your stay even tougher. What do we think? Yeah. You could do both D and yeah. yeah. Sometimes there could be noises going on. That yeah. Could possibly help prevent that by giving earplugs or having the station be a little quieter at night. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with asking our patient a question, but let's also try to be empathetic along with asking that question and just instead of saying like, oh, well, what's the problem or what's wrong? You know, trying to get more empathy behind that question as well. Good. All right, next question. My spouse has a lot of questions, but he isn't here right now to ask. So should we say, we can have your doctor give your spouse a call? I mean, probably not a horrible response, but B is your response should have written, um, your spouse should have written down the question so we'd have them now. Should have planned ahead. Probably not very nice. 
Uh, we had a patient last week whose spouse had more questions than you can imagine. I think she had us on speed dial. <laughs> well, first of all, we don't need to talk about other patients and that's really not appropriate. Uh, D, what kind of questions are they? I think the problem with D is, you know, our patient might not think we're taking them or their spouse serious if we just say, oh, well, what kind of questions are they? Like, if the spouse has questions and they want to talk to the doctor, should we let them talk to the doctor? Yeah, we're not going to stop them by vetting the questions. We don't need to know what the questions are. That's really not our business. Um, and then E, it sounds like you're, um, like keeping your spouse informed is very important to you. Yeah, we're acknowledging the fact that the spouse has some anxiety and some some questions, and we want to make sure that we're doing that for our spouse. You first and then A. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you first and then A. Yeah, I don't know. I think A is tough. Um, we never want to make promises for the doctor, but we can, you know, acknowledge that we're going to um, reach out. Yeah, because <laughs> we don't know exactly what that doctor can do. Um, all right, I'm really tired of this. No one knows what's wrong with me. So A, I can have the doctor make time to speak with you when he comes in today. Well, I'm pretty for sure the doctors are always seeing our patients daily, so I don't know if that's probably the best response. Um, B, this is going to take some time. You need to be more patient. No. <laughs> Uh, C, when my spouse had a similar health incident a few years ago, no one had any answers. It was terrible. We were leaps and bounds ahead of where we need to be. So that's the tricky thing. I think we think that telling a patient our own situation is being empathetic, but not necessarily. They don't need to know about our, our spouse or our children, and they don't need to know that, you know, they're frustrated, but we're telling them we're doing better than what has happened in our past. That's not necessary. Um, D, have you expressed these concerns with your doctor? Or E, I can see these have been really hard on you. Or this has been really hard on you. So, E. So response tendencies. So if you look back at what you originally uh, answered compared to what we just discussed, if you most of the time answered A, you were trying to solve their issue. If most of the time you answered B, it's considered criticizing your patient. If you answered C, you're one-upping them. D is a probing question, and E, every single time on those questions was the most empathetic. I noticed when I first answered these questions, I was always doing D. I think that's a mom thing. Um, as a mom, you're probing, like when someone says, oh, I don't feel good, you're like, oh, did you poop today? Is, does your stomach hurt? Like, did you eat? You know, I think we're very much, as humans, we're probers, but we're really trying to get to more of that E where we're empathizing with our patient. We're not just asking them questions and not acknowledging their feelings. And so we really don't necessarily want to solve or criticize. Um, we want to empathize, but then we can slowly like probe into that issue. So like I said, probing necessarily might not be the answer. Um, so we're gonna watch a video and then talk a little bit about it. And they're very short videos. So it looks like you're gonna be discharged on Thursday. I don't think I can put my wife through this. I don't want her to have to take care of me. Well, is it the pick line that you're worried about the most? Yeah, I guess. Well, your wife will get a thorough lesson from the home care nurse. She'll make sure she knows what she's doing. It's really not that hard once you get the hang of it. Basically, Mr. Jones at the beginning <clears throat> stated that, you know, he just didn't want to put his wife through this. And he wasn't very specific on what he wanted to put his wife through, but clearly he's going to get discharged. He's probably worried about several things, but the nurse chose to just say, oh, is she worried about the pick line? Well, yeah, that's probably one of the concerns, but it might not be what he was worried about. It might not be what she's worried about. And honestly, this is a, a, an example of how probing isn't necessarily always empathetic for our patients. 
because that is a very specific thing that the nurse assumes that the patient is upset about or worried about, but it's not really asking our patient what they truly are feeling and empathizing with all their concerns. So we have to be careful with probing because it is very specific and that just might not be where the patient is yet. So it looks like you're gonna be discharged Thursday. I don't think I can put my wife through this. I don't want her to have to take care of me. Oh, I've met your wife. She's great. I'm sure she can handle just about anything. She is. And we'll make sure she's here when we go through your discharge instructions, so she'll know everything she needs to do to make sure that you're in good hands when you're home. That's good. I have an example of solving. Um, telling uh, our patient, oh, your wife's fabulous. I met her. I'm sure she can handle it all. I mean, who's ever been in that spot in their personal life where you get told, oh, you're amazing. And you really feel like you're literally drowning in your work or whatever you're trying to do. So just because someone else thinks that you're amazing doesn't mean that, you know, our patient or our patient's family members aren't feeling very, very, very overwhelmed. And so just telling our patients, oh, we got this all figured out for you. Like we're the puzzle solver. We got it all handled. Is it necessarily empathizing with them? We do need to still understand their concerns, ask, you know, in a way, what are they worried about? And not just saying, oh, you're fine. We got all of it on the paperwork. You'll be fine. So we have to still make sure that we're empathizing, not just asking those questions that are specific or just assuming that because we have, we created a plan for the patient that they're okay to go home. So, it looks like you're gonna be discharged on Thursday. I don't think I can put my wife through this. I don't want to have to, I don't want her to have to take care of me. You sound really concerned about your wife. She does everything for me. Everything. She deserves the world. And this is what she gets. Years of taking care of my sorry self. It's just not fair. I'm so sorry. Why does it have to be so hard? I think I, I, I need to go to rehab before going home, but how do I break this to her? Well, we should really talk about this with your case manager. Would you like me to call her so we can talk about it? It'd be good. So what's the first thing the nurse did? Sat down. Sat down. And then what else did the nurse do? Listen. Listen. Yeah. Listeners control the conversation. So she had an open ear, and then he eventually got to what his concerns were. They weren't the pick line. They weren't necessarily the wife taking care of him is that he really thought that he should go to rehab first and he didn't know how to tell his wife that maybe the wife is like oh, i can do this we don't need anybody to help me like i don't need anybody to help us like i got it but he really wanted to go to rehab and he just needed help to communicate that to his wife so the nurse then suggested speaking with a caseworker so we eventually got around to what he was really concerned about without asking a lot of questions. We didn't see the nurse pepper him with a lot of questions. She just really sat there and listened and let him voice all of his emotions and concerns. So here's an example of I'm thirsty and what all of these categories really break down to. So solving a person that is just gonna solve a comment, I'm thirsty, is going to say, here, have some water. Criticize would be, well, you shouldn't have eaten so much salt, and you're never drinking enough fluids. 
One up would be me too. I haven't had a sip of water all day. Probing would be, did you drink any water or do you have a headache as well? And then empathizing would be, I hear you. Sounds like you can use a drink. Let me see what I can do. So our first response uh, tendencies, good or bad. So if you're trying to solve something, if you're a solver, the positive is it does allow you to quickly address the patient's issue. However, you might not have identified the background or the real issue with the, with the comment, I'm thirsty. Um, criticize, there's really nothing positive ever to criticizing a patient. Uh, negative, of course, it elevates emotions and enforces, it, you know, it, a patient's gonna withdraw. If you're gonna tease someone, judge someone, criticize someone, they're not gonna talk to you. They're not gonna trust you. What up, um, positive. When personal, it may help you connect with the patient. And then negative, over time, patient becomes frustrated, feel like they can't necessarily win. I think we've probably all had like that friend or that family member or that coworker that no matter what you tell them, they're like, oh my gosh, me too. I was going through this last night, blah, 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 blah. So I think sometimes as an individual, I thought that that was maybe empathizing, sharing my own drama or concerns, but it is technically one upping someone and that can make someone feel frustrated that they don't ever get heard. And so we do need to listen and not necessarily always give an example from our life. Um, probing positive allows you to get um, the answers that you seek, of course, you're asking a direct question. However, it might not be the right question. Um, so probing can necessarily, it could lead in the wrong direction. Um, for instance, just assuming when someone says that they have a stomach ache, that they haven't pooped, like, you know, asking that question could maybe necessarily not go in the right direction. Um, positive, if we're empathizing, helps manage emotions and opens up communication. The negative part is that it can sound insincere if you aren't really committed to the approach. So it depends how you use your voice and your nonverbal communications. So if someone is telling you they're thirsty and you're just looking down and you're like writing something, you're like, oh yeah, okay, well, mm, yeah. And then you don't really address that problem. Like you are empathizing, but you're not necessarily making that eye contact. You're not showing warmth. And so you do have to make, that, make sure that you're uh, watching your nonverbal cues as well when you're empathizing and having those conversations. Um, so saying you don't have time to empathize or listen, I mean, that's really just not true. We have to make time. That's part of our job, of course, but more than being part of our job, that's just what we should do for our patients because that is truly showing our level of commitment as healthcare workers. Everybody in this hospital needs to have that empathy for our patients and our coworkers uh, we need to just make sure that we are making time for our patients. And I think that if we take the time to slow down and speak to our patients and our coworkers, we will understand how that will build better relationships and that can just overall make our daily work experience better. I know when I have conversations with someone, when I walk by them, I'm like, oh my gosh, I love your haircut or your outfit looks amazing on you. Like that's really just something that obviously makes my day because I get to tell someone that they look fabulous. But when we get those compliments as well, you know, listening and just taking some of those things in, it's very nice. It's nice to have that approach with our patients and our coworkers. Requirements of empathy, you know, just making sure that we are um, seeing the world as others see it. So this is, uh, I think the best example is pets or um, our patients are concerned about maybe like a garden, like it's summertime and maybe our patient is like, oh my gosh, everything in my garden is gonna die. And they've spent a long time planting all those things. So just listening to what their concerns are, not judging them for what their concerns are. Things might sound little or different to us or not as important, but they are very important to our patients. Identify another person's feelings, um, and then communicate your understanding of those per, um, individual's feelings. So that's the empathy part, kind of repeating that concern to them. Oh, I hear you're thirsty. How can I help you? What happened, you know, looking back on what our conversations were instead of just say, oh, here's some water. 
um, also about um, watching nonverbal cues. And so one of the things um, that we kind of want to brush up on is recognizing the state that some people are in when we approach them. So the gentleman in the top left corner, what would you say, what kind of vibe is he putting off? What kind of feelings do you think he's currently having right now? Worry. Worry, yeah. What else? Stressed. Stressed. Either he don't feel good. Yeah, maybe he doesn't feel good, right? Maybe he's not saying anything. No. How about the lady uh, right next to him, to your right? She looks like she has cancer. Angry, did you say? No, I said she looks like she has cancer. Okay. <laughs> what kind of emotion do you see coming from her? Like, it looks like worry. Worry? Anger. Anger. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's changing too much. Bottom left. <clears throat> Bottom left. <clears throat> you look a little bit positive. Maybe a little sad. Despair. Despair. How about the gal in the middle, on the bottom? Distant. Distant? That's the one that I said. That's the one that I said. Okay. The one that I looked like she has cancer. Okay. <laughs> Worry, uncertain. And the gentleman on the far bottom right. Sometimes it's hard to tell. It can be a challenge to tell from somebody's uh, body language. But it's okay to say, it looks like something's worrying you or it looks like something's wrong. Can you tell me more about that? When we communicate empathetically, we've identified the patient's emotions and we understand their needs. So what do we do with that? We wanna build um, a a powerful empathy statement. And this was one of the things that uh, we felt was very important, so it is on your handout that you can take with you, is okay, how do I do that? Some people are not that comfortable um, speaking in that language or in that manner, so how do I do it? This kind of basically lays it out for you. It's called ESP, so the E is empathy. So restate your patient's feelings. It demonstrates your ability to connect with them. S, which is stop. <laughs> This one's the hardest for me. Silence prevents us from jumping in with a solution and offers the patient time to think and speak. That was one of the things that I noticed in the video of empathy is that the nurse didn't jump in and, and start talking with him. She let him go and they ended up getting to the root of the problem a lot quicker. So stopping, pausing, allowing people to speak, and then probe more open-ended questions at the end to allow deeper understanding of what they just told you. So certain ways that you can introduce these things are, uh, I can imagine that this is very frustrating for you, or I can see why you're so anxious. I can hear how upset you are, or it sounds like you're very disappointed. It's a great way to open up and uh, uh, start that connection. Another way to communicate empathy is uh, sometimes an empathy, empathy statements just don't feel right. And that's okay. Sometimes you don't know what to say in the moment and you can absolutely say, I'm really sorry for what you're going through. I wish I knew what to say to help you right now. It's, it's very humbling, but it's totally okay to tell your patients you're not sure what to say right now. What things should we never use? We saw in the first module, that video, at least, that's a statement that's kind of hard to stop using after you're used to using it, but make sure that's one that we totally avoid, at least. Everything happens for a reason. I've had somebody tell me recently that just stop at everything happens. Everything happens and that's okay. Everything happens and we're gonna deal with it. 
we don't need to tell them that they don't need to be worried about it by saying, well, there's probably a reason why that happened. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. Again, you're telling them that what they're worried about is not important. I know how you feel. Sometimes we feel like this may be an empathetic statement, but it does come across sometimes as a one-upper. We never know exactly how someone is feeling. Same with I understand. So let's try and avoid those phrases when we try to convey empathy to our patients. These are also extreme words that can escalate your patients, so we need to avoid these as well. You look really worked up. <laughs> that usually gets them worked, worked, worked up. up. <laughs> You're hysterical right now. All right? Usually, again, makes them a little more hysterical. Outraged, mortified, disorganized, unglued. You're being ridiculous. I think one I'd like to add to this list is calm down. <laughs> right? It doesn't calm anyone down. It sends the message that they shouldn't be worked up about something. But it's important to them. That's why they're upset about it. All right, so we're gonna watch a series of video clips and I'm gonna ask you, I'll give you several options of things that you should, uh, that we could respond with and you tell me what you think would be the most empathetic response. What can I help you with, Mr. Jones? I have been waiting here for 15 minutes. When I press this button, it means I need help. we say, Mr. Jones, I'm so sorry. I know you need help, but so do a lot of other people. We're really busy and un unfortunately we're really short staffed. I promise to respond more quickly next time. Or B, Mr. Jones, I can see you're upset. How can I help? C, Mr. Jones, this must be frustrating for you. Or D, Mr. Jones, I know how you feel. 15 minutes can seem like a long time when you need help. What do you think would be the most empathetic way to respond? I hear a lot of B and C, it's C. The reason A is not the right answer is this statement comes across as dismissive. It communicates that you wish you could care, but you just don't have the time or the resources. <laughs> B, it's a better option, but this one moves into more probing without allowing them to respond. C is the correct answer, the most empathetic answer. D, although we can put ourselves in someone else's shoes and imagine how they may feel, we never really know how they feel unless we ask. What can I help you with, Mr. Jones? Do you have an update for me? Because nobody's got an update. I'm supposed to be discharged today and it's almost 6 p.m. Nobody's talking discharge. We get this a lot, don't we? <laughs> I usually respond with, they don't give me that information. <laughs> so options. A, calm down, Mr. Jones. Let me see what I can find out. B, Mr. Jones, you seem upset. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. C, oh, Mr. Jones, I can see this is really bothering you. Or D, this happens all the time. I'm sorry that you feel this way. What do you think is the most empathetic response? C. You're correct. The reason A is not the right choice, calm down, sends a message that this person should not be upset and dismisses a concern. It's a form of criticism and it may incite strong emotions. On B, this one includes one of those phrases we should never say, the it's nothing to worry about phrase. C was the correct answer. D, the phrase is dismissive and can seem, at, seem critical. The underlying message is this happens all the time and therefore you shouldn't be bothered by it. I saw your children were here earlier. <laughs> Might be the last chance I get to see them. All right, so 
So options. I can see that your kids are very special to you, Mr. Jones. B, Mr. Jones, don't say that. Everything's going to be fine. C, you seem really sad, Mr. Jones. How can I make things better? Can I bring you anything? Or D, you're so lucky that you have a great relationship with your kids. I'm not that lucky. I don't even talk to my son very often. A, you're correct. Why is it B, the right answer? Although it seems like you're reassuring them, it communicates that since everything's going to be fine, there's no reason for any additional conversations. C, it starts with empathy, but then moves into probing without them allowing the patient to expand on their concerns or emotions. And D, this is the one-up statement that shifts the focus to you and away from our patient. I don't need any help to go to the bathroom. See this one a lot as well. Optional answers, don't be embarrassed. This isn't a big deal, I help patients all the time. B, but I really should help you. I don't want you to fall and hurt yourself. C, Mr. Jones, don't be ridiculous. Or D, I'm sorry that you feel this way, Mr. Jones. It is D. I automatically jump to uh, B because a fall is a lot of paperwork. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we gotta get out of that mindset of thinking that everything could be a risk and be a little more empathetic sometimes. So the reason A was not correct is this statement does not invite the patient to open up and share their worries. In the patient's eyes to them, this is a big deal. Um, B, our first response should be empathetic and refrain from solving their problem before you've actually listened to them. And then C, the don't be ridiculous is a, is a hot button word we shouldn't be using. It's very judgmental and critical. Although we intend to communicate that he shouldn't be embarrassed, it can make him feel worse. Can I help you find someone? Oh, my husband. I don't know where he is. I don't know where anything is, in case you couldn't hear that one. A, you have nothing to worry about. I'm sure he's fine. <coughs> B, let me call the ER and see if he's down there. C, I can see that you're worried about him. Or D, when did you last see him? Where is he <coughs> supposed to be? <laughs> C is the most empathetic. A, although we're meant to reassure her, we don't know that any, there isn't anything to worry about and we don't know that he is fine. B, it's a great way to attempt to find him, but we don't know what the best solution is. Plus, we haven't done anything to, see, to acknowledge her anxiety. And D, when, stand, when starting with probing, we do nothing to alleviate her anxiety. Can I help you find someone? It would be really nice. <laughs> These signs are completely confusing. How should you respond? A, you're out of line and you need to calm down. Do you think that would calm her down? Probably not. B, I'm gonna call security and have them give you an escort of where you need to go. I can see that you're all worked up. There's that hot button word again. I can imagine how frustrating it is not to be able to find where you need to go. What's the most sympathetic statement? B, yeah. A, not only does this come across as criticism, but it will likely escalate the situation. B, we're moving directly into problem solving and bringing up security will also intensify the situation. And C, using one of the extreme emotion words that we talked about will likely intensify the situation practice on how we should empathize with our patients. We're going to kind of go through how you can implement it yourself in your everyday work. So our self-reflection today is going to be how often do we acknowledge suffering? Things that you can do. Identify patients' emotions based on their spoken words. Identify patients' emotions based on their body language. Refrain from judgment regarding the patient's reactions or emotions. 
using an empathetic statement as first response to your patient's concerns. Pausing to allow your patient time to speak and avoid jumping in with a solution right away. And five things we want you guys to never say. I know how you feel. I understand. Everything happens for a reason. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. And that, I, at least, at least you have this. So on your paper, we listed these three buckets for you um, so that you can write down. One thing that you're gonna stop doing currently that would be helpful in showing empathy to your patients or your coworkers. One thing that you're gonna continue doing, something you already do and you're gonna keep doing. And one thing that you're gonna start doing, something new, something you're gonna try out. Does anybody wanna share one thing they're gonna start doing, something new? The more people that share, the faster this goes. <laughs> What's one thing you're gonna try? Validate their feelings. Validate their feelings, yeah. It's amazing how well it works. I used it for like a day and my patients were much more easier. Pausing. Pausing, yes. As I, as I said during the beginning, that's really hard for me because I automatically start thinking of what I'm gonna say next. Oh, here's, here's what I'm prepared to say next. Just pausing, stopping, taking a beat, makes a big difference. So in summary, we talked about assessing progress with implementing, implementing our caring behaviors for module one. Then we reviewed <clears throat> our issue this uh, module, which is acknowledging patient suffering through empathetic communication and identify of spoken and unspoken needs. And we talked about personalizing your own strategies to effectively integrate them in your routine. So take the paper back to your areas with you, kind of review it, see some areas where we can make change, use that ESP, it helps really open up conversations with your patients. Does anybody have any questions or comments? <clears throat>